students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive many, oppor many opportunities. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. We would like to encourage each of you to get special benefits and support the Dole Institute by becoming a friend of the Dole Institute. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Hearing assistance is available and we have a loop seating section at each program designated by a sign. If you have any questions about the loop or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. Before we be begin tonight, I would like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and just ask one brief question. And now please welcome Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Good evening and thank you Luke very much. Good evening and I would like to say welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and the 2017 Journalism and Politics Lecture with Juju Chang. In fact, on your program it says, Anchoring Nightline with Juju Chang. I love saying her name, <laughs> you know, and so it's always a pleasure. Tonight's interview will be conducted by the director of the Dole Institute of Politics, uh, Bill Lacey. We would like to extend special thanks to the, our co-sponsors this evening, the KU William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications, and Kansas Public Radio. Tonight's guest is the Emmy Award winning co-anchor of ABC News Nightline and a contributor for Good Morning America and 2020. She has been recognized for her in-depth personal narratives set against the backdrop of pressing national and international news. She has covered major breaking news for decades for ABC News, including Superstorm Sandy, the Orlando nightclub massacre, and the Boston Marathon bombing. She has also profiled some of the biggest newsmakers of our time, and her work has been recognized with multiple Emmys, Gracies, a DuPont, a Mero, and Peabody Awards. It is really my pleasure this evening to have you welcome Juju Chang and give her a warm Jayhawk welcome. Thank you. Well, Juju, thanks for um, joining us on the KU campus at the Dole Institute. We appreciate it. Let's start off tonight with a question we usually start our guests off with. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your education, and how you got interested in journalism. That is such a great opening question, Bill. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, one of the things I often say uh, when I visit colleges is, you know, to be able to have events like this and open it up to the community is such a, a great opportunity to form community, so I'm glad you're all here. Um, I think, just to give you a little insight into uh, where I grew up and how I grew up is, um, I was born in Korea and moved to the States with my family when I was four years old. Um, and much of my childhood was infused with the immigrant struggle, you know, watching my dad trying to make his way in this country, um, knowing that we were a little bit of an outsider, um, strangers in a strange land, as Moses might say. Um, our food smelled funny, my parents' accent sounded funny, and I always, to this day, as a reporter, have a visceral connection to the outsider. Um, that said, I grew up pretty much assimilating into the California girl culture and uh, worked as an overachiever um, and made my way to Stanford University. Um, but I think one of the reasons why early on I uh, thought about going back, you know, backwards in time, why I wanted to be an engineer happened in 1979. And it was during the hostage crisis. And you'll recall uh, Americans, the U.S. Embassy was overrun in Tehran. Um, 52 Americans were held hostage for 444 days. And uh, Ted Koppel sort of began a nightly coverage of it, which ended up being, it was America held hostage, and it eventually morphed into the show that I now anchor to this day, which is called Nightline. But in 1979, when this was all uh, happening, I was 14 years old. I was a middle schooler. And when the hostages were released, I jumped onto my 10-speed bike 
and I pedaled around my neighborhood like Paul Revere on acid. I mean, I don't know. And I was screaming to anybody I saw, like, the hostages are free! The hostages are free! And I think in some way, fittingly, that was my first moment of being a journalist. Because in many ways, I would have been a town crier in a previous life, right? I mean, I just wanted to tell everybody and share the news. Um, but I think the other big turning point for me happened in college when I went to Stanford. Now, I thought I was going to be an engineer. I'm Asian American, so I think that goes with the territory. And I grew up just mere blocks from where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak invented the Apple PC in the proverbial garage. And so that's where I thought my future lied. And freshman year, my physics midterm, I got a 27 out of 100. And I literally failed. And I thought, my life is over. This is horrifying. And I was so humiliated. And I was literally curled up in a fetal position. And I think college students experience this. It's their first challenge, right? But at the same time, I was taking a required political science class. And I ended up um, loving it, working really hard in it, getting an A plus and winning a political science prize. And it was as if the clouds parted, the sun shined, and I saw a new path. I feel like I'm overmodulated, so I'm going to take this out. So I feel like that, to me, was a sort of one-two data point that sort of showed me a path. And then the third thing was, back in the day, my mother said to me, you know, there's that Connie Chung lady. <laughs> and she was right. She was like the one Asian American role model that was out there. She was talking about politics. And I had done some speeching, speechifying in high school. And my mother said, she could do it, you could do it too. And it, to me, to this day, it points out the importance of role models in our world. Because I really, she resonated with me in a way that no other broadcaster did. And years and years later, during 9-11, when she was a colleague of mine at 2020, I finally worked up the courage to go and talk to her. And I said, you know, Connie, you know, I just want you to know that I was in college and my mom and role model, blah, 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 blah. And I thought we were going to have this incredibly meaningful kumbaya moment. And she was like, oh, Juju, if I had a nickel for every time an Asian American girl told me that, I would be really rich. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized she was a beacon to so many young women who may not have gone exactly in her direction, but went in that direction because of her as opposed to engineering or lawyering or doctoring, which our parents told us we had to do. Um, so in many ways, those were the three sort of, you know, tipping points for me. Mm -hmm. What was your first job in journalism? I was a gopher, basically. Okay. So I went to Stanford, and, you know, like all things in life, I made a connection there, and my uh, thesis advisor, um, helped me get an entry level of all entry level jobs at ABC News. This was back in 1987. So I literally, the joke is that I made coffee and I made copies. And I ran around and did all those things and I worked my way up. I went from there to being uh, a researcher at World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. I was an off air during the 1992 campaign. Um, I you know, covered natural disasters and plane crashes and every bit of national health care policy, anything that you can think of. And it was only about seven years in that I switched and went on camera. And that's when my on-camera career began. But during the entire time, I stayed at ABC. Okay. But then you did do some work, I think, at some local TV stations, right? I did. I worked at KGO in San Francisco, which was actually incredibly formative for me because a, I was home again, so it was fun to cover my hometown. But it also gave me a real connection with our viewers, right? Because when you're at the national network, you're sort of, you, you dive bomb in and you come back out. But when you're a local news reporter and you cover school board meetings and you cover the storm that's coming your way and you want to tell people to batten down the hatches, it was a real connection that I thought was really helpful. Plus, it gave me a chance to do a lot of live shots on local TV and get better at that before moving forward. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, so would you say to like our students here who are here tonight who are thinking about broadcast careers that starting at that local station and having a lot more opportunity is the way to hone your craft and improve? 
I think so. I like to say it's nice to make mistakes while not that many people are watching. <laughs> so that was always my, you know, sort of a rule of thumb. But on the other hand, I tell young people that this business has been shrinking and splintering and being disrupted for the last 30 years. And so all the rules change from the, certainly the time that I was coming up in the world. But I think the same sort of guiding factors work, which is, you know, double down on the skills that are going to be relevant no matter what the technology, right? So whether it's reporting, writing, editing, shooting, all of those things will apply whether you work, end up working for BuzzFeed or ABC News or Facebook. And so all of those skills are things that you can continue to grasp towards as you're working your way up. Mm -hmm. What was, can you kind of describe the differences and the transition you had to go through working for a local TV station and then going back to an on-camera role at ABC? A lot of it was story selection because the local, local television and local papers cover more obviously of the local community disruption. So whether it's crime or you know, um, local events that were shaping uh, people's lives. From a network level, we look at local stories as a microcosm for national policy, right? So we would, I would dive bomb into little, I remember going to Tulsa and looking at sort of pl flood plain mitigation, right? So in some ways, it was a local story in Tulsa and the way they were using their green spaces to uh, mitigate against flood damage. But on another level, it was a national policy because you were looking at ways in which you could engineer communities to avoid flood you know, loss. So the biggest adjustment for me was a little bit of you know, the types of storytelling that you could do. But at the, at the end of the day, it's all storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. What was your role with Good Morning America? What did you do there? What were some of your interesting things? I, uh, I did so many fun stories at Good Morning America, everything from uh, you know, looking at the best water slide in the country, um, which was really fun. And uh, that was in Schlitterbahn, Texas, which sadly later um, became the site of the, the um, casualty, the young man. That was horrifying. I, should, I shouldn't laugh about it at all. Um, everything from that to, I was, my role there was newsreader. So I was the news anchor uh, at Good Morning America. Um, this is when George and Robin first became co-anchors. Um, and it was a, a wonderful time um, to be in the national spotlight, mm -hmm. you know, day in and day out. But at the same time, it was also some, you know, like every one of my jobs has been disruptive to my children's lives in some way or another. And that was particularly challenging because I was away every morning, right? And they were having to sort of fend for themselves with their dad. And trust me, he was here at the Dole Institute. You know, getting them out the door is not his fort. So, um, so yeah, it was it, that was a challenging time too. I'm curious, and I'm sure our audience is curious too. Talk a little bit about doing a morning show like that. When do you have to be there? You have to do. They have to do all the makeup. You've got to do your prep. So you got to be there. A Bill, little you're bit implying early, I so. need a lot of makeup. Is that what no, you're saying? No, I'm not implying that at all. <laughs> um, yes. In fact, the alarm would go off at 3:45 in the morning. Um, which meant that I was fighting to try to get to sleep at 7.30. Um, but, you know, then I would go in, we would read in to everything that was happening, then we would prep our stories and we would get ready to go. Um, but now, my clock has shifted. So I'm now working at Nightline. Um, and, and thankfully, at Nightline, I have two co-anchors. So only ever once or twice a week am I there late at night. But I'm still occasionally called upon to do Good Morning America. So there are short turnarounds or there are times when I'm working late and the next morning I'm <laughs> up early in the morning, at which point, you know, I try to steal time away and go home for a nap or to check in with my kids because, you know, I've done enough stories about parenting now. I have three sons to know that, you know, some studies show that you really only have to have three minutes of functional parenting every day, which was always reassuring to me um, <laughs> because that's about what I felt like I was putting in. But, um, you know, really just to be able to check in and get into their head uh, for 20 minutes was, was important. And just to for them to know that I was, you know, keeping up on what was pressing in their lives. And s still to this day, I do that. So 
Um, I'm incredibly grateful to FaceTime because today, as I was driving in from Kansas City to Lawrence, I was FaceTiming my kids and saying, don't forget that math quiz tomorrow, and what about that baseball practice, and like, da -da -da -da, and did I get that form? And you know, it's that kind of stuff that is literally the 12 minutes of functional parenting that I put in every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about uh, moving to Nightline from GMA and what the, you've covered some of the differences, the morning to evening and maybe only having to do anchors a couple nights a week, but what other differences are, are there in those formats? The biggest, I mean, I'm sure you guys have sampled both shows over the years and Good Morning America is Primarily, its strength is live television, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on um, with live guests and live studio events. Um, the pieces, on average, that you see would be, and, and I still file for GMA, so they're like a minute and a half or two minutes. And then the reporter live wraps in, 10 seconds in, 15 seconds out, 30 seconds out. That's about it. So it's a kind of a snapshot of what's going on, right? But what we do with that same story on Nightline is we give it a nine minute take. So um, the other day we did a story about Kevin Spacey and all of the allegations. Um, a week before we did a look at you know Harvey Weinstein. Um, and we can take eight to nine minutes of television is an awfully long time. And it allows us to give context. It allows us to uh, reach for expertise. Um, and allows us to, you know, open up for what we call long-form storytelling that is fundamentally different than what happens on other broadcasts, um, both at ABC and other networks. Mm -hmm. Do you have any preference for either one of them? You know, I think that now that I'm so long in the, the tooth, I, I now know that I prefer the long-term storytelling. Um, it just provides me a chance to dig deeper um, and get sort of further along in the story than in the, s in the shorter pieces that, that I get to do. So for example, one of the pieces that I did very recently was an exclusive with Chelsea Manning, um, who was released from prison after seven years. Uh, it was a celebrated case. It was perhaps one of the most tumultuous cases in, in modern American history, looking at the intersection of national security secrets, because you recall, um, she was confused. She was um, Private Bradley Manning when she released hundreds of thousands of documents to WikiLeaks. Um, and at the time, and then once she was sentenced, she came out as transgender. So it became an incredibly um, contentious story because embedded in this story of national security secrets in the age of WikiLeaks and whistleblowing because at what she was saying, it, the reason why she leaked them was because she um, leaked the most notorious WikiLeaks video titled Collateral Murder, which showed um, an Apache um, gunner's camera shooting unarmed civilians, uh, including two Reuters journalists. And at the time, she felt, quote unquote, justified in, in leaking this. However, if you talk to national security experts, they'll, they told us, well, there were chains of command that she could have gone to. If she really wanted to be a whistleblower, she could have gone up the chain of command. In her, what she would say is, at the time, I went, I tried to go to the Washington Post, I tried to get to the New York Times, didn't work, and so I leaked to WikiLeaks. At the end of the day, she was um, found guilty and sentenced to 35 years in military prison and held in pretrial pre solitary confinement for nine months. These are all issues that I'm having difficulty explaining to you in two minutes, right? Imagine me trying to tell this story, bringing in experts and doing that. You can't do that in less than two minutes. So Chelsea Manning's story, and it was the first time she spoke on camera after being released from prison after serving a seven year sentence. And you will call President Obama, one of the last things he did when he left office was to give her a commutation. And so there were a bajillion issues to get into, not to mention being this transgender rights activist and um, groundbreaking transgender services while in prison. Right? So this is not an easy story to tell in any context, but in television, it took us an entire show to tell that story, right? And to give it the proper te 
uh, context to interview the deputy NSA director who said, you know, I, I think it's a supreme act of arrogance for what she did. And yet, when the commutation came down, I looked at it and I read it and I thought, she served her debt to society, she should be allowed to have a new sentence. These are all contextual elements that cannot be done in two minutes. So for me, I'm grateful to be on a show where we can do multifaceted, incredibly complex stories um, and bring them to the public at a, you know, on television. It's very, it's very rare. Okay. I've got, this question is, is kind of a challenging question. It's, it's not difficult, but it's challenging, and you'll understand what I mean when I get to it. But I want you to answer it in, in, in uh, nightline form, long form, rather than good morning <laughs> okay, America okay. form. Talk about two or three of the most memorable stories you've ever covered. Whew. And you've covered a lot, so I know that's kind of a tough, open-ended question. It's a really tough, open-ended question. Um, one of the ones that stays with me um, is the story of a uh, firefighter from Mississippi who went into a burning house and the roof collapsed and his face was burned off. And he uh, had m dozens of surgeries and uh, endured excruciating pain in rehab and with scar tissue. Um, and he volunteered to be um, a recipient of a face transplant. And so this is not a life-saving procedure, but a life-altering one. Um, and what it took for this team of surgeons at NYU Hospital, Langone Hospital, to, um, to graft this face onto this man's head. And the sacrifice of the donor's family, um, the tenacity and the toughness of Pat Hardison, who is the firefighter, to, to undergo all of this. Um, and, the, and I've gotten to be friends with Pat, and he still comes to New York for checkups, and I still see him when I can. Um, and he is doing, he and ultimately has helped in pioneering research because they've done things and learned things from his procedure. Um, he has earned back quality of life because his eyes were starting to go because he didn't have eyelids and you know all sorts of stuff. But ultimately, it felt like a love story um, because the young man who died um, and whose face was ultimately grafted onto him, I got to know his mother as well. And she talked about his spirit and his legacy moving on. And we ended up, it ended up being a larger look at organ donation and the dearth of organ donors out there. Um, but it was an incredibly dramatic way of telling that story. So, so that's one. Um, uh, there are a hundred. It's like asking to choose your favorite child, right? It's, it's a little, uh, it's a little tough. Just, but just share two or three. Two more or three that, more. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just got back from Las Vegas after the mass shooting, and uh, while I was there, and we were looking at the lists of all the worst mass casualty shootings, it hit me that I had not only been uh, at Las Vegas interviewing victims but I had been at Orlando at the Pulse nightclub shooting. And I had been at Newtown uh, in Connecticut after that shooting. And I had been at Virginia Tech after that shooting. And I had ultimately been at four of the five worst mass casualty shootings in modern history. And they have that sort of nauseating familiarity and that choreography that we've now come to understand. Um, but in Las Vegas, I will tell you, you know, and we could have a discussion about gun control and the lack thereof and, you know, uh, legislation. But I actually, from a human perspective in Las Vegas, found um, that there are stories of hope that come out of these tragedies. One of them was a, an ER doctor who was on call the night of the shooting. And he said, you know, I'm a trauma ER doctor, and on most Saturday nights, it's like, Doc, where's my ice pack? Doc, where's my blanket? And he said, but on this night, there was a line of taxis and Ubers and flatbed trucks and ambulances waiting 
to get to this hospital full of injured people. And I had seconds to triage and decide who was gonna get treatment and who was not. And I would open the door of whatever vehicle it was and the people inside were all bloody and they would triage for me and they'd say, Doc, take that guy, I'm gonna be okay. And then he said inside, people who had been shot in the legs multiple times would say, I don't need that wheelchair, Doc, give it to that guy, he needs it more. Or the orderlies would come over and they would mop up the floors and they would say, Doc, we don't want you to slip. And we don't want the patients to see all this blood on the floor. And there was a stories of selflessness and heroism, husbands shielding wives, boyfriends shielding friends, um, people running you know, away from the tragedy. And one guy who was there on the floor said to me, you know, there was one bad guy with a lot of guns, and I saw hundreds of good guys on the field trying to protect and save and be heroic. And in moments like that, where there's so much sadness and tragedy, um, I find uplift. And I've seen that time and time and time again, whether it's the Haiti earthquake or you know, some tragedy or some plane crash, you find people who are full of gratitude to have survived, you know, full of determination to rebuild, um, you know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of amazing. And then the third one I would say is probably um, Hurricane Sandy, um, which happened in my backyard in New York City. And I had covered, you know, many hurricanes, many tornadoes, and seen a lot. But to have it sweep up onto the streets of New York City, which is where I called home for 30 years, um, was really kind of crazy. And, uh, I remember trying to run across, Scott will appreciate this, the, the West Side Highway, and I was wading knee deep in you know, water, and I was wearing a pack, and I thought to myself, this is how people feel when tragedy strikes their community. And it was one of the first times where I didn't feel like you know, I was covering a story. I felt like it was affecting you know, the people around me and my community as well, and it really sort of brought that home to me. But I could sit here and tell you hundreds of stories about things like that, moments like that throughout my career that I feel blessed to have experienced. Is there any example of a story that, of course you don't want to cover any bad news, but bad things happen, but is there any story that you got into and you felt, I really wish I hadn't had to do this story? Oh golly. Um, Yeah, I mean, all the time. Uh, usually it has to do with loss that seems um, difficult to see meaning or purpose. I mean, I'm one of those people who thinks not necessarily that things happen for a reason, but that we as humans find meaning in um, and inspiration from. But, you know, I was in Las Vegas and went to go meet a family whose young daughter you know, her early 20s, was about to get engaged. Her boyfriend had, like, chosen a ring and, you know, all of that. They had a whole life in front of them. And she was gunned down, and I really felt like I can't see it right now. I don't see the purpose. I don't see the meaning. Like, maybe 10 years from now, but I don't see it right now. And it just made me sad. And I wished, as you said, that I didn't have to be here mm -hmm. right now telling you this story. Okay. You mentioned, you referenced, uh, um, I think I got this right, you referenced when you were talking about being at Stanford. Yes. That as an Asian American, you always felt you would be like an engineer yes. or a scientist or something like that, but you wound up in journalism. Did you ever find, as an Asian American woman, did you ever face any what you thought were unique challenges because of that? Um, you know, there were times along the way where that. I was clearly, um, you know, one of the few non-white people in a room, and I felt I had to represent, you know, and, and represent, well, I remember being in a school in South Carolina, and some of the kids uh, came up to me, and, and it was clear, and some of them said as much, that I was the first Asian person they'd ever met in their entire lives. And one wow. of them said to me, can you see okay? through your eyes? And I was like, yeah, I can. But it wasn't, they weren't being malicious, right? It was just they were asking curious questions. So there have been times along the way where I've felt that compelled to represent. 
Um, but I do sense other people's view of me as, uh, as other, right? As I was saying, like, we, I look different than people. And people, you know, I've gotten a lot over the years, like, oh, you speak English really well. <laughs> And I, you know, you know what that means, right? Or like, where are you from? And I just like to mess with people, so I'd be like, New York, and they'd be like, No, where are you really from? <laughs> and I'd say, California. And they go, No, no, where are you really, really from? And you know what that means is you're not from here. You're not American, so where are you really from? And so the whole, you know, you speak English really well. I finally came back with a good retort, which is, you know, you speak English really well. And I would say, Well, thank you. So do you. <laughs> speak English, isn't that nice? But I think in the last year or so, and I'm on Twitter, you know, and in the last year or so, I have been called chink on Twitter more in the last year than I have probably in my entire life combined. And I've been called the other C word, which is the insult for women more on Twitter in the last couple years than I have in my entire life. And, and I find it's really a sort of a, a new wave of sort of assault. And I, I obviously won't let it deter me. But you know, it is not without coincidence that you know, earlier this year, I went and interviewed um, Richard Spencer, who is the head of a neo-Nazi movement. Um, and he advocates, he, he likes to say that he coined the term um, that was often featured on Breitbart, but um, he was part of a collective where, you know, his group, he sort of threw a Nazi salute, and many people in the audience threw the Nazi salute. Um, and he likes to say that he coined the term alt-right, which found a home on um, Breitbart. And I do think that when, you know, when I went to go meet him, and we had a long conversation back and forth, I asked him if I would be allowed in the white ethno state that he envisioned, and he very cordially said to me, no, but you could start your own ethno state if you'd like. So, you know, these are the kinds of stories that I've been doing, you know, at Nightline to sort of look at the currents in our society right now and where they're coming from and what their intents, intent is. and and the blowback that comes, uh, you know, more recently than not to journalists. And like, don't forget that form. And I realized, oh my God, it's Neil Shapiro. I couldn't do it without Neil Shapiro either. And I used to think, people used to say, oh, it's because Neil's in the business, right? That he's sympathetic. He understands because he knows the demands of a broadcast journalist. And the truth is, whether Neil was a dentist or he's in television, he would be sympathetic because that's who he is. So it's another thing that I tell my young female colleagues, like, make sure you pick wisely because <laughs> they're going to be your life partner. That's what that means. And so I lucked out. It was dumb luck that I, you know, fell for Neil Shapiro at the time that I did. But yeah, it made a big difference. He's a very good partner. Okay. I have one final question I'm going to ask tonight, and then we're going to open it up to your Q&A. And we have Claire and Alec. Are you guys doing the mics? They're right here. Bill says you guys so, ask really tough questions, so I'm actually really nervous now. Um, but let me ask my final question, and then we'll open it up to yours. So if you've got questions, be you know, thinking about putting up the hand and getting the attention of one of our students. They'll bring by a cordless mic so we can get it on our video. But uh, Juju, we've got a lot of young people here. I'm sure a lot of them are from the journalism school. Uh, what would you say to them about the importance of going into a journalism career, but also a few pointers, things that they ought to know as they're starting out? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, I think that one thing that I say a lot to young people starting out is you don't, one doesn't ask someone else to be a mentor generally. Mentors find you and they are attracted to you and they're attracted to you for essentially one reason and that is because they see something in you that they want to help invest in and promote. So and generally far more often than not that has to do with hard work, right? Because 
I know that in the office there have been dozens of interns that have gone through the offices of Nightline. But the ones that strike me are the ones that are not just smart and talented, everybody's smart and talented, but the ones who are really hardworking and put in the extra mile are the ones I'm like, hey, what's your name? Where did you come from? And who are you and where are you going? And then I'm sort of pushing them, I find myself pushing them along to go, you should go meet my friend over there and blah, blah, blah. Because that is the organic sort of way to make an impression. You don't just email a bunch of people randomly and say, would you meet with me for coffee? And then sit back and listen to them pontificate. That's not what it's about. You have to lean in, as Sheryl Sandberg would say, and offer ideas and thoughts and suggestions and have them make that investment in you and bring you along. So that when they recommend you to the next person, it's because it's based on things that they've seen in you, that it's real and genuine and organic. Okay, very okay. good. Okay. Uh, open it up to questions from the audience. We've got a lot of students here, so students, take advantage of this. Got an opportunity to, uh, okay, we'll go right back here to start. Okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you. Um, second of all, um, I was just curious, with the advent of streaming services such as Netflix and Hulu, as well as uh, the art of new media, what do you see as the future of broadcast journalism? You know, we're trying to make that up as we go along, I will say. Um, and we are experimenting with um, podcasts. So we did, we serialized uh, a murder uh, that took place um, in New York City, I think like 20 years ago. And we took our archival footage and we went back and did new interviews and we updated it and we serialized it, right? So it's stuff like that. It, at the end of the day, what we do and I was saying this to the dean of the journalism department at dinner, is we tell stories. And I like to tell stories that have some sort of relevance that can be either inspiring or illuminating or helpful in some way. But at the end of the day, they're stories. It's nonfiction storytelling, right? So whether you do that in a bite-sized piece that happens in a tweet, or in a larger version that happens in a minute Facebook share, which I do. I mean, I would encourage you all to, to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Um, or the two minute story that airs live on Good Morning America, or the live Facebook Live that we do, or the nine minute piece that ends up on Nightline. At the end of the day, fundamentally, it's all storytelling. And it's all gotta have a good hook, it's gotta have an interesting perspective, um, and, and you want to see sort of where each of these stories take you. Um, and ultimately, those skills are the same regardless. It's good writing, it's clever, crisp storytelling, you know, and all the elements that that takes. You know, from a broadcast perspective, it's shooting, editing, you know, all of that. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, got a question here? Yes. Hi, Juju. My name's Stu. Stu Grosser. Um, one thing, or two things. First of all, the um, Schlitterbahn happened here, not Texas. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. That's okay. And That's there is shame. another Juju plays football for the Steelers. I've heard about okay. him. I'm very excited about him. But he's not near as good looking as you. Oh, thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> and I have a question concerning, this is you, what you're thinking about and what concerns you about the world that's going to happen. Uh, I know you see a lot, you hear a lot, but I just wonder what you're really worried about. You're a mother, husband, you know, you have a husband, you're, you know, family, you've got, you know, a lot around you, and I'm, you see things, and I know inside you might think, wow, this is not good, or I don't like this, this bothers me. Those are the, that's what I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Oh, gosh, there is so much that bothers me. Um, <laughs> Where do I start? How much time do we have? Um, you know, I always admonish my children um, and I say to them, live with gratitude because I've been to so many places in the world where people have far less than we do. Um, and the ones that I find uh, live meaningful lives are the ones that live with gratitude. So I'm a huge enemy of cynicism. And I'm a huge um, enemy of people who are not engaged and involved in the world. 
I mean, the p fact that you guys are sitting here tonight tells me that you're engaged and involved in the world. And to me, what makes me nervous are people who uh, are not putting their shoulder to the wheel and getting involved in, in the public discourse, in uh, public service in some way, or in the public arena. Um, because we all know how easy it is to become complacent um, about the world around us. And I think we all know that, that we're living through extraordinary times and it's time for everybody to sort of look around and do what you can to, to make the world a better place. I mean, this is sort of broad, but you know what I'm saying. Okay. Got one right here, okay. Hi. Um, I'm a student here at the journalism school. Um, so we as student journalists, we're pretty idealist. Um, we have a lot of thoughts about, you know, presenting the truth and only the facts and not and making sure that we're not biased and making sure that we're not inserting anything that shouldn't be in um, what we're writing or saying. Um, but I often find that today, because of the amount of information available out there, people are looking for a human perspective and they're looking for something to give them context or to help interpret the facts that we're giving them. So in your um, experience, uh, how do you find sort of the human side to stories and how do you put things in context for people without feeling like you're, um, you know, interpreting the facts for them but, but rather helping them to understand what's going on? Does that make sense? Is that muddled? Yes. I mean, I, you know, it's a very... Um, big and profound question, and I can answer it in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I'll answer it in a couple of different ways. One is, I think that there is journalism, and then there is um, editorializing, right? And I think that there's room in our world for both. Um, on my Twitter feed, I follow all of the major newspapers' uh, editorial writers, right? So whether it's Nick Kristof talking about, you know, human trafficking or, you know, uh, various columnists who have a perspective and will share their opinion with you. Um, and then there is the larger question of, you know, what it means to be a journalist and to bring your perspective and your framework into stories that you do. And frankly, that is why newsrooms need to be reflective of the communities that they serve, right? Because every story I come at, whether, whether I, I think it, it is an asset for me to come at it with the perspective of being a woman, right? Or being a mom, right? Or being an immigrant. Um, and those are all perspectives that help frame the way I see the story and the way I tell that story. And that is why it's incredibly important that we don't have just one perspective in the newsroom. My co-anchors at Nightline, one is an African-American male named Byron Pitts, who came from 60 Minutes, who is an incredibly lyrical storyteller, but has a completely different perspective and worldview than I do. And my other co-anchor is Dan Harris, who has written the bestseller 10% Happier and is a big, you know, meditation buff, but also, you know, white male, you know, has a different perspective. And we're at different stages in our lives, but it makes us each tell different types of stories. Um, doesn't mean that we don't, we can't each tell the stories. Any one of the three of us could go cover a mass shooting or, you know, the opioid crisis, right? But who we are is intrinsic to the stories that we cover, and it's why it's so important for, for, our, for our newsrooms to reflect the communities that we're living in. Um, I'll tell you a short story. I, I was talking to one of the DACA um, dreamers, right, whose lives were hanging in the balance. And, uh, you know, he was telling me that, you know, his father washes dishes in a restaurant in New Jersey and, you know, his father had gotten sick but he couldn't take any time off because, you know, he was undocumented. Um, and these were the types of stories that, you know, fly in the face of the legislation and the policy that, that is, is being debated right now. And it's, I think it's important for all of these stories to come to light and be told so that people and the rest of the public can weigh these decisions based on what you're saying, the human, the humanity of them, and not just what's on paper. Okay, we have a question right here. Thank you so much for being here. So the press has been under attack um, especially of late, uh, 
of perpetrating quote unquote fake news. Uh, and I'm just curious to know what the fourth estate is doing about that, if anything. Um, I have noticed on CNN, they have that commercial about this is an apple, whether you look at it from the left or the right, it's still an apple. Uh, and so I just would be interested in, in uh, your uh, take on that um, and what um, ABC News is doing or, or, or any other aspect of the um, uh, social media and media, telecommunications industry. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I, th I think ABC has just recently launched a new um, campaign along those lines um, under the rubric of straightforward news where I think people are looking for um, straightforward storytelling where there isn't a lot of embellishment one way or the other. Um, I think fact checking has become vitally important in this climate and I think people are beginning to recognize the virtue and the value of that. Um, and I think ultimately um, our reputations will rise and fall on how well we adhere to those core principles. Um, I think, I know I got into journalism and I think most of my, uh, you know, almost all of my colleagues did, um, for some variation of the idea that we want to speak truth to power and that we want to speak for the voiceless and the powerless who may not be represented. Um, and so that is a shining, uh, guiding principle for all of us. Um, and that is true uh, whether it's this administration or the Clinton administration or the Obama administration. We always try to fly by those, you know, those principles. Let me ask a follow-up to that, Juju. You, you spoke a few minutes ago about, you know, at one point there were three networks and you referenced, you know, I think Tom Brokaw and you referenced uh, Peter Jennings and, and somebody else. And I go back further than that and I wonder how challenging is it for as a society for us to function when students will find this hard to believe but I was younger than you once. And when I was coming up and watching TV news, it was Huntley Brinkley, Walter Cronkite and Howard K. Smith. And everybody operated from a set of kind of similar facts. And then they branched off from the facts with interpret. How is it now that we have a proliferation of people who claim to offer the news and facts? How challenging is that to our society? Well, I think it's, it's funny. I'll give you a little bit of historical perspective, too, in that regard. Um, Walter Cronkite was known back in the day as the most trusted man in America, right? He was the CBS News anchorman. And um, it, I'm revisiting this because uh, PBS just came out with the Ken Burns series on Vietnam War. And uh, I remember talking to a number of people who had seen the whole series. And I said, so what stays with you? What lasts? And he said, the amount of government misinformation that came out during the Vietnam War, um, that they were just putting out facts and figures, and uh, the press was, you know, exposing it left and right and left and right. They were saying we were winning the war, we weren't winning the war, they were underreporting casualties, blah, 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 all sorts of stuff. And it was only when Walter Cronkite broke down and literally started crying on national television that, that it was, the moment was like, oh, that's when we lost the Vietnam War. When you lo lost Walter Cronkite, you lost the war. And I think that we, we as journalists try really hard not to sort of show our perspective, right? We really try very hard. And I think, and yet there are times when, you know, you have to stand up for what's right and you have to stand up for truth and justice in the American way. That's who we are as human beings and as American citizens. And I think that there are very few times in our careers when we would ever have to do such a thing. But there are moments where when pressed with the facts and being given, you know, misinformation, we have to go with the facts. Okay. Do we have, we have one right here. Okay. 
Hi. Um, at the beginning of your interview, you, you talked about how um, your experience of feeling like an outsider growing up has helped you connect more um, with outsiders in your stories. I was just wondering if you could give us an example of a story where you really connected with an outsider and because of like your shared experience were able to like tell their story better. I think the DACA, the DACA student uh, is one, but I also think um, I almost always, um, I, I do sympathize with those, for example, this latest um, election, you know, uh, there were a number of um, candidates. There was a, a mayor from Hoboken candidate who was a turban-wearing Sikh and two, I think, school board candidates who were, one was Asian American and, well, one was East Asian American, one was Indian American, and there were posters put out that said deport on them, and the other said, you know, don't let terrorism win. When the Sikh, where, when the turban-wearing Sikh candidate was born in New Jersey and was American, um, and I felt very compelled um, to tell those stories in part because you realize as an immigrant, as I said, you often just by your appearance are deemed as other. Um, and so I do feel like I have that perspective all the time. Um, but I feel like we, I've done a lot of stories about um, gender bias as well, right? I mean, there are a lot of stories where we talk about um, unconscious bias, right? And there's an, a startling statistic that, you know, we talk about Silicon Valley and all the dot-com billionaires out there. And, you know, part of that huge industry is um, venture capital, right? And right now, Silicon Valley is under um, scrutiny because there's a lot of sexism involved in the bro culture in Silicon Valley. And if you look at venture capital <laughs> pitches, right, um, and you take the exact same venture capital idea, and you overlay a male voice with, you know, PowerPoint presentation, and then you do the exact same PowerPoint presentation, the exact same idea, and overlay a female voice, the male voice gets, I don't want to get the numbers wrong, but I think it's something like 70% funding, green lights. The female voice gets something like 39%. And it's the exact same idea, right? So I feel drawn to tell those kinds of stories because I'm a woman. And I think a lot of it, too, has come, surfaced during the Harvey Weinstein scandal and the hashtag Me Too scandal. Um, you know, without getting into any gory details, you know, I've shared many a story with my colleagues, having been in the business for 30 years, you know, um, and, and it, it gives me a perspective and a life experience that's not going to be, you know, um, unbiased, but I think it's ubiquitous, and I think it's the kind of thing that a lot of men never saw, but women understand. So it's just a like, little example. Okay, we're going to go to the very back. Hi. You've spoken about covering things such as mass shootings and natural disasters, and oftentimes the job of a journalist is to, more often than not, break bad news rather than good news. How do you cover things such as this day in and day out, with be out without becoming cynical yourself? Uh, it, it isn't so much the cynicism that creeps in for me, it is just, um, they call it vicarious trauma. Um, you know, I was in Africa um, just before Orlando, and I traveled with then UN Ambassador Samantha Power to Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria. And I was walking through refugee camps where there are a hundred, I mean, tens of thousands, if I remember my numbers correctly, of families who had fled literally what sounded like medieval, you know, um, pogroms, right? Like their villages had burned down, their livestock were killed, their fathers were slaughtered in front of them with their, you know, like knives across. I mean, just brutality that's like should be in Game of Thrones and nowhere else. But listening to people, looking in their eyes, and having them tell you these horror stories um, is traumatic. And seeing all these little kids barely clothed and barely fed and seeing my own children transposed, it was very traumatic. And then I came home and I was sleep deprived and exhausted and Orlando happened. And next thing I know I'm on a plane to Orlando and I'm interviewing this woman who was in the bathroom as the shooter was, 
you know, walking back and forth, and she was laying on top of her cousin trying to make sure she didn't bleed out. She eventually died. I mean, like, on and on and on. And I, you know, for the next three weeks, would, like, go to the grocery store and look at bananas and burst into tears. Like, it was just this bizarre, like, post-traumatic um, stress. Uh, and there are counselors at Columbia University who want to talk to journalists like me who've, you know, uh, just seen and heard so much. Um, but I think that for me, reconnecting with my family, talking it out, and um, being able to tell their stories is incredibly therapeutic. Um, and I try to keep it all in perspective. But it's, as I say, it's less the cynicism, it's more the despair that I have to push back. Okay. Yeah, well, okay, good. On that light note. Uh, so earlier you talked about having your second son and feeling uh, different about your career and worried about it. I, I feel like in the modern times you're kind of forced to choose between uh, a very successful career where you're climbing up a, a ladder and becoming more and more successful or having a family. So uh, how did you deal with that and be, be privileged to have both? Um, I do consider it a privilege. I um, have the utmost respect for um, every choice that uh, women make because they're not, none of them are easy. Um, there are so many stay-at-home moms that I rely on to remind me that I missed that permission slip or don't forget that field trip or, you know, he needs rubber boots tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, for me, um, I was incredibly lucky to end up in a career that allowed me the flexibility that I had to, because I think at some point something has to give. Koki Roberts once said to me before I had kids, you know what, Juju, you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. And I really took that to heart and she, she lived that out in that when her husband, Steve Roberts, was um, overseas for US News and the New York Times, she was raising her kids. And she was like, you know, she's incredible, she was like, jarring peaches and doing, you know, cobblers and all sorts of stuff. But at the same time, when her kids were older, then she went back and she is Cokie Roberts. So, you know, she had a full-throated, full-fledged career. Um, I think that we all make it up as we go along. I've met so many women who raised their kids and then went to law school, you know, or raised their kids and then became an artist. Um, or, you know, there are, there's no one way to do it, and I would encourage women who are thinking about it to just not, there's no one mold. Um, you're you're going to feel your way and find your way. Okay, we have another question in the back. Hi. So I know that you have a lot of experience with talking with all sorts of people, and uh, at this stage in the nation, it feels like there are a lot of very passionate feelings and uh, difficult discussions being had. And uh, I'd like to hear your experience with talking with people who are maybe uh, in an interview or in discussions, p people who are very aggressive or defensive, and uh, any strategies that you've found effective as far as uh, you know, disarming and getting through to people. And uh, yeah, having those difficult discussions um, in a way that is productive and uh, feels like both people can kind of get their feelings across. Ah, uh, such a good question. Um, I think some of the most contentious um, interviews I've had are the ones where um, somebody, I think, is either deflecting or not being fully truthful with me. Um, and so for me, the best way to combat that is to do my homework. Right, so that if they are trying to be evasive or, you know, um, deflecting and going in a different direction, that I can follow up with two or three points, facts, counter questions to get them back on message. Um, but I always try to be respectful. I I don't um, I don't. Um, I'm not a, you know, I, I, I don't bully people in the interviews. And I think one of the things that I find is, um, you know, people like to set boundaries. Like, I'm not going to answer that. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to answer, but I have to ask the question, right? So as a journalist, I can't not ask the question. 
Um, and that's, to me, the biggest push-pull that I've had, you know, of, of late. Okay. Got a question over here? So you've mentioned that you've covered a lot of tragedies and different um, things, including mass shootings and Hurricane Sandy. What's one of your more uplifting stories that you've covered that is, uh, keeps you more optimistic for the future? Oh boy, so many. I wish I'd written some down. Why didn't I think of this in advance? Um, let me think. Um, there are a lot of uplifting stories. Um, there's one that is also embedded in tragedy, but can show that one person can make a difference, and it was um, Pete Frades, who was the inspiration behind the incredibly viral campaign, the Ice Bucket Challenge, right? And he was, at a very young age, diagnosed with uh, ALS, and it is a death sentence. And yet, rather than wallow in self-pity, he said, um, he made these brave and bold predictions. He said, I'm going to be a game changer. I'm going to get, you know, big, uh, entre you know, big philanthropists like Bill Gates involved. I'm going to raise billions of dollars, blah, blah, blah. And the doctor, like, laughed at him and said, how are you going to do this? And he harnessed the power of social media and his grit, uh, which is an overused word, and his loving family who have been with him every step of the way um, are like a, a constant source of goose pimply inspiration to me. And he's the kind of guy that makes me never, ever, ever want to complain about anything in my life. And he's so inspiring and uh, so soaring in, in, uh, in his leadership. When you're in, on the road like in Las Vegas and when you're back at home, can you tell us about what you do, all the stuff you do when you're not on camera? That's a good question. Um, I don't have much of a life. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I do think that it, my life is uh, kids and work kids and work. Um, and I try really hard to carve out time for my friends. Um, and that's another big part. I, I mean, I, we do, I know this is going to sound funny, but I, <laughs> I am very involved in our synagogue. Um, I don't look very Jewish, I know, but um, I am. And, uh, and so we do uh, things in that community that I find meaningful and, uh, and fulfilling. Um, and really, I think, you know, I interviewed Dr. Oz uh, with, about his book, and he said, you know, it's lunch with your girlfriends can, um, can help you live a longer life because it de-stresses you. So I try really hard to connect with people uh, that I can pour my heart out to. Um, I really value friendships, um, and it's, it's part of why I'm here with Scott and Leah Richardson because they invited me, and I've known them forever, and to be able to catch up with them is, you know, feeds my soul. So um, that's a big part of it. It really is. And then I do 10-minute yoga on YouTube. That's, that's like my thing. That's my jam. But you were saying beyond work? No, what about the work you do off-camera? Oh, the work I do off-camera, you mean to, to get the work done? What does that consist of? What does that consist of? What did we not see? Um, there is a tremendous amount of reading that goes involved to, uh, to research. There's a lot of phone calling to get people's perspective. Um, and then once I've consumed all of it, I come up with a sheet of questions, which is pretty quick. Um, we go out and we shoot stuff and we, uh, I do the interview, we have two cameras, and then they come up with logs, which is like a, a transcription, right? And now we do that these days with voice, um, voice, transcri voice trans transcription. So then we read through the interviews, we pick the sound bites, we lay them in, we share it on a Google Doc between the producers and the seniors and me, and then we, you know, write a script. A television script involves sound from the interview, narration, um, and facts and figures and graphics, right? Um, and then once or twice a week, I'm there anchoring the show 
which involves sitting in studio and shooting those pages as well. But um, so much of what happens behind the scenes is uh, just talking about it. You know, like, what do you see the story? How should we go? What do you think's important? Well, we shot it. I thought this was important. No, I think we should start here. You know, it's like, it is storytelling. Like, do we start at the beginning, middle, or end? Or no, do we start here and foreshadow and go back in time? Or I think it's confusing. Let's do it. Like, we're ripping up scripts all the time because we want to tell the most engaging story. So it's a lot. OK. We have a question here. Hi. So. <laughs> You said earlier that the path you began in college led you to this life of journalism. So I was wondering if the path that you took didn't lead to journalism and you would take a different path, what do you think that path would have been? And just like what kind of career do you, would you have enjoyed engaging in for your life? That is such a good question. You know, I'm not even sure. I mean, I will tell you a little story about when I was in college. I worked at the Stanford Radio. And the guy who trained me was a news director by the name of Danny Pearl, who ended up um, being the one who worked for the Wall Street Journal. And he was kidnapped by the Taliban and ultimately executed. Oh, um, just to bring it, yeah, a sad point to it. But the truth is, I left college pretty sure that I wanted to, to make my way in the world of journalism. I think had it not, I mean, the way that I envisioned it is I thought I was going to go do grunt work in New York for like a year or two, and then I was going to go work at a local station and work my way up and maybe become a local anchor because what I wanted to do was help shut down the crack houses in San Francisco. I f was very crusading, you know what I mean, like the crusading journalist. Um, and I think that now when I think about what I will do after my career, I think it's in that same vein. I think after being, uh, you know, an objective storyteller for 30 years, there are things that I've seen along the way where I want to weigh in. And I want to, you know, uh, become more active and work in some arena or another that will um, allow me to be an activist. So I don't know where, when, how, but I feel like I would in that way be either a community activist or a policy activist in some way or another. I've always enjoyed um, what I do. I, I do a lot of work with the Council on Foreign Relations, um, which involves like interviews like this and you know talking about you know policy, um, both international foreign affairs but also domestic policy. So I feel like there's something in there that I'd like to do. I'm just not sure yet what. OK, do we, we have a question up here? Wait for the microphone, please, sir. There you go. Would, uh, are you going to shoot for the moon and be our first lady president? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see myself uh, running for office in any time soon. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, that's one thing I've never really been interested in is running for office. Um, but I do sense that there are a lot of people out there who um, are being inspired to run for office for the first time, um, get involved civically. Um, and I find that to be an encouraging sign. As I say, I think people need to be engaged and involved. Um, what happened in this election in 2017 um, has a lot of fascinating implications for um, the next few years in terms of you know, what will happen in the midterm elections, what will happen in 2020. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people who are um, coming to the world of politics um, uh, with renewed vigor and, and interest. And I think that's a good thing. OK, do we have any other questions? Don't see any more hands. Juju, thanks so much for a very interesting oh, it's evening. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming out. I would point out, and it should be on the back of your program, we will have our student advisory board program on December 5th. It will be on single payer health care. We're going to have a for side and, a, and an against side, so it'll be a great, interesting discussion that night. Hope you can join it, join us for it. So thank you all for coming out tonight.